Hello and welcome back to International School History Teacher. In this lesson I'm going to look at the nature of state power. How is the state able to control people? How is it able to rule over people, make people do what the state wants rather than what the individual wants? For example, I don't want to give large sums of my hard-earned cash to the state but I agree to pay my taxes. You might not want to go to school, but you do. And although humans are genetically predisposed to try and avoid dying, millions of humans have willingly, sometimes happily, been prepared to die for their state when ordered to do so. So how does the state do it? The state controls the individual through three distinct mechanisms – coercion, persuasion and consent. Now in this introductory lesson I want to look briefly at each of these methods. Firstly, coercion or force. This is the most obvious way the state controls individual action. It's what sociologists call formal social control. It was Max Weber who first said that states are best understood as institutions that have a monopoly of the legitimate use of violence. The state and its government has power. It can coerce or force an individual to act against their will. Nothing and nobody else can legitimately use force against you. That's the point. That's what Weber meant. So what does coercion look like? Laws that restrict the individual citizen's freedoms are the basis of the government's coercive power, but they require a state apparatus of judges, the police, the army, secret service, etc., if these laws are to be effectively carried out. An individual will therefore obey the state because they fear the power of the agencies of state coercion. In the context of these lessons, it's important to note that coercion is much more important as a source of power in authoritarian states than democratic states. In fact, in the most totalitarian of states, citizens will also come to fear their fellow citizens because a culture of denunciation is established. It becomes the duty of loyal citizens to denounce, that is to give names to the state authorities of any other citizens they consider to be guilty of disloyal behavior. Individuals fear the consequences of acting deviantly because non-conformity has a significant cost. Yeah, it's quite straightforward, really. Because of that cost, you conform. And finally, coercion can be just as effective when it is threatened as much as when it is used. All that's needed is that people fear. They fear the knock on the door in the middle of the night. The second means through which the state controls the individual citizen is through persuasion or influence. This is what sociologists call informal social control. Now, a state and its government have effective influence when people and their behaviour can be deliberately directed without their conscious awareness of this direction. This requires the state to have an ability to affect the way people think, to influence what citizens come to value, what citizens come to dislike, and, and to help define what is considered normal or natural, things that are unchanging. When informal social control is at its most effective, citizens are not even aware they're being manipulated. Citizens believe that the views they hold and the behaviour that results from these views are personal to them that they've arrived at these views independently. Their views are their own and have not been imposed on them. A really good example of informal social control is the state's encouragement of national identity and patriotism. If the control is effective, people will believe that the existence of their nation is a natural permanent phenomenon and their love of it perfectly normal. In contrast, those who do not feel patriotic are considered deviant and untrustworthy. In times of state crisis, when the state is under attack in a war, for example, 
informal social control is much more visible. The crisis demands that freedom of the media be curtailed and that critics are silenced, as state control of the media through censorship and the production of state propaganda becomes the new norm. Again, it goes without saying that in authoritarian states, informal social control is much more apparent than in democracies. In fact, the more totalitarian the authoritarian state is, the more the state visibly intervenes in the cultural life of its people. In the most totalitarian states, there is little or no distinction between propaganda and the arts, for example. Stalin is supposed to have said that he believed the role of artists is to become engineers of human souls. In peacetime, education is a much more powerful means of cultural conditioning because the subjects being conditioned by the state, that is children, have by definition not yet fully developed the critical faculties and maturity to be aware of what's happening to them. If you've ever been fortunate enough to live in another country for any length of time, you will quickly appreciate that what can appear to be foreign, odd behavior to you seems perfectly normal and natural to those who've been brought up in that state. Finally, the third reason why citizens conform and do what the state tells them to do is because the citizens want to. This is called the consent of the governed and is based on the belief that the state has authority over the individual because the individual has voluntarily agreed to be governed, because it is in their interest to be governed. And in this example, there is no social control. A government has authority, that means the state has legitimacy, when people accept that the government has the right to control their actions. Now, there are two types of consent that we need to consider because this is not simply a story about democratic government. Firstly, explicit consent is generated through political means, most obviously through the democratic elections in which people choose their representatives in an open and fair process. But this is not the only way, and it's not only through multi-party elections, that explicit consent is generated. Being engaged in an ongoing decision-making process in a village, in a village community, for example, or in a place of work where decisions that are made can make genuine differences to people's lives, this, this can generate as much consent among the governed as any multi-party elections that take place every five years and never result in any apparent change or the representation of anything other than a narrow range of opinion and alternative policies. Okay? The second form of consent is implicit, not explicit, implicit. Implicit consent can be generated through economic and social means. The state provides a satisfactory standard of living, for example. The citizens accept the control of the state because the state satisfies their material needs. Implicit consent is expressed through the depoliticization of the citizenship, through apathy and ignorance about the way in which the process works, the whole political process. So if the state can make its citizens indifferent to the existence of the state and its power, then it is altogether easier to exercise that state power. So there you have it. That's how the state controls the individual, through a mixture of coercion, persuasion and consent. Thanks for watching. Yeah.